Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Research Tuesday. My name's Bob Hill. I'm the director of the Environment Institute here at the University of Adelaide, and it's my pleasure to do the introductions this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains, and the land on which the university's campuses here at North Terrace, at Waite and at Roseworthy are built. I should also point out that we're being recorded by the ABC tonight. It's um, important I let you know that because when you're asking questions, uh, they will be recorded. So just be aware of that, please. Uh, tonight's Research Tuesday event is called Protecting the Catch. I'm sure you all are very aware of and enjoy the great diversity of seafood, the seafood that's available for us out there. But whatever your taste preference, your love affair with seafood may be under threat. Almost 90% of fish stocks are already at maximum capacity or are overexploited. And with the demand of seafood only expected to increase over time, how do we keep it on the menu? Tonight's speakers will explore the sustainability, environmental, commercial and ethical implications of this issue. We'll start tonight's event with a presentation from each speaker Following this, all five speakers will sit down in front of us here and engage in a panel discussion facilitated by uh, Zoe Doubleday. After that, uh, you'll all be invited to ask questions of the group. So let's get underway. It's my pleasure to begin by introducing Dr. Neng Yi Liu. Dr. Liu is a senior lecturer in the Adelaide Law School here at the University of Adelaide. His research centres on enhancing global governance regimes for better protection of the oceans, with particular focus on the polar regions and South China Sea. He also serves as an associate editor of the Yearbook of International Environmental Law from Oxford and is a review editor of Frontiers in Marine Science. Please join me in welcoming Neng Yi. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Bob said, uh, my name is Nenye, and I am actually specialized at Law of the Sea here at Ali Law School. So then why I'm doing this? What is my passion for tonight's Protecting the Catch? And before we kick off, let me first acknowledge the generous support from National Science Week, that we are, which is actually going on at the moment, uh, South Australia Community Grant to make this workshop happen. The National Science Week is Australia's annual opportunity to meet scientists, discuss the hot topics, do science, and celebrate its cultural and economic impact on society. First held in 1997, National Science Week has become one of Australia's largest festivals. Last year, we saw a staggering 1.3 million people participate in over 1,800 events and activities across the country. And you can actually get one of the uh, this year's event brochure just outside this lecture theatre. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, every two years they publish a report which is called the State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture. So this year it was recently published. Uh, it says, I quote, we human societies face enormous challenge of having to provide food and livelihoods to a population well in ex excess of 9 billion people by the middle of the 21st century, while addressing the disproportionate impacts of climate change and environmental degradation on the resource base. We love fish, we love seafood, and we'll be eating a lot, and we were also advised that we fish is healthy food. So since 1961, the annual gro global growth in fish consumption has been twice as high as population growth. So officially, According to FAO data, 33.1% of global fish stocks have been fished beyond biological sustainability. So this picture is taken recently uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, a city near, uh, I think, the east coast of China. So this is an fi uh, old fisherman. He has been uh, doing this business for uh, decades. That's what his catch after a day's hard work, one piece of big fish. 
and this is reality. This, it, it might not happen yet in Australia, but it happens in many parts of the world. And how are we going to deal with this? As an international lawyer, we do provide solutions, sort of. We have established the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which entered into force in 1994. We have the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, which entered into force in 1995. There is International Whaling Commission, which was established after the Second World War, that pro provides actually caps or even uh, prohibit commercial whaling in uh, world oceans. And we have lots of regional fisheries management organizations that, is, that are on uh, business uh, for a long time. But what, it, what, but what the fact is, I quote, once again, one of the uh, world leading Law of the Sea professor, who was also one of my supervisors uh, in the early days when I was doing postdoc, Professor Robin Churchill, who wrote the first Law of the Sea, Law of the sea textbook in the world, uh, said in 2014, on the occasion of the 30 years of anniversary of, uh, after the signature of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It is difficult to escape the conclusion that the provisions of the UNCLOS, and UNCLOS in general, have proved almost completely useless. This might be a bit radical to prevent the adverse impacts that fisheries have had on the marine environment. So what can we do then? How can we make sure that we and our children and our grandchildren will enjoy the same delicious seafood as we have? How can we protect our catch in the future? And more specifically, how can we develop laws the law is an end product that reconciles conservation and development for fisheries. We need to talk to science. We need to talk to economics. We need to talk to different uh, people from different disciplines. That's why tonight we have a panel of different uh, uh, experts from uh, science, management, and law to discuss this topic. So I probably will stop here, and which is a bit uh, overarching ideas why we are doing this. Before I stop, I just want to draw your attention that this is the latest example that how uh, international community uh, has done to protect the catch. So last year, uh, the world's largest uh, high seas marine protected area was established uh, in the Antarctic water, uh, which is called the Ross Sea Region Marine Protected Areas. It's just down here. And, uh, it's a very good, it's a, it's a very good uh, development, but at the same time, the duration of the uh, MPA is 35 years, and also in these large uh, areas, which is 1.5 million square kilometers, we have around 1 million square kilometers, which is non, no take, no fishing, but there are also other zones which can allow some kind of research fishing. So what is exactly is research fishing then? So this is a question, not only for lawyers, but also for scientists to answer. So I will just stop here. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Reg Watson. Um, Reg is a professor of fisheries and ecological modeling at University of Tasmania. So he just came across Tasman Sea. He collaborates globally in research, looking at impacts on and limitations to fisheries, the impacts of climate change, and other factors on marine food security, and marine ecosystem modeling. Welcome, Reg. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nengi. I'm going to start talking about some of the other big parts of um, the seafood story. And for some of you, this may be new. Others will know it well. And that's that around the world, what we might consider seafood, more than a third of it actually isn't directly consumed by human beings. This is the Chilean or uh, Peruvian anchoveta fishery off the south coast, uh, off the eastern, western part of um, South America, one of the biggest fisheries in the world. And this is what happens to that third of the seafood of the world. It's ground up and it's reduced, and it's cooked, and it's turned into fish meal, some of which we'll talk about, it'll come up in aquaculture feeds and animal feeds later in the, 
in the presentations. And of course, some of it turns into that precious fish oil, which we, a lot of us consume daily. So that's one of the things about fish meal, fish seafood that people don't consider. The other one is about the historical significance of seafoods. This is uh, from a, a publication that dealt with um, primitive humans 74,000 years ago huddling in caves off the uh, tip of South, South Africa when, uh, with very small population numbers, things were right on the knife edge. When Mount Toba in Indonesia exploded and things went a bit pear-shaped in terms of climate and basically they lived on some of the shellfish and seafoods that they could garner from the shore and that basically kept the human population alive and perhaps we'll need seafood in the future in the same way. In fact, seafood is a very global uh, commodity. If you look on, on the size, it says source here, you can see along the coastlines of the countries, those countries that are colored more uh, brightly in the red colors are the places where more of the productivity of the, of the marine ecosystems is turned over to the seafoods that we harvest. So all of, the, all of those coastal areas and actually between them in the high seas where you have the tunas. And on the consumption side, on the other side is where colored by the countries again in, in order of the per capita consumption of seafood is where that seafood goes. And the trade is absolutely one of the most global food commodity trades that, that's going. In fact, if one of the things I try and do is, is try and connect the fishing and the aquaculture to where it's eventually consumed. If we start on the left hand side here, we have the various fishing areas of the world. We have the Africa very small, fishing area. This is in terms of the billions of US dollars that the seafood was worth in 2011. So that's a very small part. And then Asia, a very large part. And the yellow part there is important. That's the high seas. That's the area of the seas that isn't claimed under the jurisdictions of the various nationalities. And as you move to the middle, those are the regional fleets that are harvesting that. And you can see the high seas is feeding into the various fleets of the world and then on to the various countries where it's consumed. It's a very global process. But seafood, wild seafood, is definitely finite. We have the sun here and it's beating down and it's supplying the energetics for all of the marine ecosystems. It's growing that plankton, particularly along the coastlines. It, again, the brighter colors are where the, where the growth and primary productivity, the growth of those algae is the greatest. They underpin the whole marine food web. You've got to have the nutrients there, usually by upwelling or rivers, and you've got to have that sun. And that is a, it's something we can't do a lot about in terms of the energy coming from the sun into the marine systems. And if, if you look at kind of the food web or food pyramid here, you have the sun at the bottom feeding the whole marine ecosystem, and it comes up, percolates through from the bottom as the herbivores eat the primary productivity, they're in turn eaten. There is uh, obviously an inefficiency in that. We don't gain a kilogram for every kilogram we consume, though we might think we do. There's heat losses and and out the side, some of it dies, but we actually harvest our seafood at various stages in this food pyramid. It could be at the bottom, it could be right at the plant level, or it could be herbivores, and so on. So we are actually taking out of this marine food web our seafood. But the inputs from the bottom and the way it generally works, that's finite. But there are regional pressures. In Australia, we live in the Asian region with one of the, one of the greatest fishing fleets of the world, and it's increasing. And in fact, if you look at on, on this graphic on the right-hand side, you can see if you look in terms of the, the power of the engines, of all the combined engines of all of the vessels, over time since 1950, going from left to right, to the present time, you can see great increases in some of the fishing fleets of the world, particularly in the Asian region, the region that we're in. So there is a lot of pressure on the seafood and it is finite. And in fact, if you do the projections forward, you combine all the various climate change models, it's, it's also not that 
pleasant to look at because they seem to agree that the areas in the red here are areas where we can expect a, a relative downturn in our ability to, for the seas to produce seafoods. And in fact, this is combined on this graphic with production from the land, from agriculture. So there are some countries in the world which are not only facing um, downturns in, in the ocean's ability to produce for us, but they might also have agriculture problems as well. In fact, some areas of the world are, are, are being buoyed up, as you'll see uh, from other speakers, aquaculture in various forms, whether it be marine or fresh water, is producing uh, about half of the seafoods. And here in Indonesia, where they, where they have the shrimp or the prawn farms, it's very hard to even see where the land is separated from the water. They, this could be the future of, of our Earth in terms of producing food from the sea. If you look at the consumption of the global consumption of seafoods, you get this graph coming from 1950 going upward. And in the blue lines, the blue dots rather, are the are the actual consumption figures. The black diamonds are the FAO UN's projections. And of course, beyond that, it depends very much on what happens to global populations. And it, it might mean that we have to uh, reduce the amount of the wild seafood that's going into that aquaculture produ production. Or if we, can, if we can actually reduce the amount of the marine content into the aquaculture, we can actually get that top horizontal line, which might mean that if the projection for the, for the population is more conservative, that we might be able to produce sufficient seafood into the, into the uh, 21st century. So what we've learned so far in various research, I'll just sum up here, that most of the seafood that we consume is being sourced from further away, whether it's wild or farmed that the use of the oceans is intensifying and the amount of the ocean that's being used and harvested is increasing. And that if we do make some changes in, in, through aquaculture production, we might be able to meet the demands of the future populations. In the, it, for wild systems, we might have to do significant changes to be able to do that. So how we can meet the future seafood demands? Well. Of course, we have to maintain our current resources. We, we have to find the right balance between conservation and exploitation. Those people that are having problems with each other at the present, they representing different parts of the story, they have to work together. I would argue we have to know more about the provenance of the seafood that we're consuming. In order for us to make decisions, we didn't need to know what it is that we're being offered to consume. We need to minimize, obviously, the impacts of climate change. You saw how they could negatively affect uh, the world's seafood production. We have to look, if possible, at developing new fisheries. There's possible things with, with say, small pelagics, the ones that live close to the surface. Some of those stocks haven't been fully utilized. There's been glimpses of deep water, lantern fishes, and huge numbers. There are possibilities for new, uh, seafood, new seafood productions in wild, but of course, a lot of it will be through farming. But we have to find a way of making that aquaculture sustainable. We can't destroy all the marine ecosystems in the process. And as you saw in some places of the world, the marine coastal areas have been highly modified already. And that brings me to something that's probably more um, controversial, and that's about ocean engineering. Now, that could mean as much as we're trying to sequester the CO2 under the sea so that we don't have the climate change projection, the climate change that is being projected, or it might mean that some people are actually trying to fertilize the oceans with iron or, or just letting effluent go off the land on purpose to try and increase the production of the coastal areas. Um, it depends on those choices that we make, um, how much we are willing to modify the wild environment. And obviously, with population pressures, there will be significant pressure to do those modifications. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Our, ne our next speaker is 
uh, Associate Professor uh, Margaret Young. Margaret is uh, specialized at international environmental law and especially international trade law at the University of Melbourne Law School. Uh, in particular, she's uh, the author of Trading Fish, Saving Fish, the in interaction between regimes in international law, for which she was awarded the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN Academy of Environmental Law Junior Pro Scholar Prize in 2012. I was actually there when they announced, made this announcement. So welcome, Margaret. The floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Tonight's panel demonstrates that fisheries are a truly global concern, with seafood coming from further and further away at increasingly unsustainable rates. Too many boats are fishing for fewer and fewer fish. Can international law respond? I'm going to suggest that there is potential for international law to help address this problem but it requires the inclusion of a range of perspectives, not just of states and their officials, but also of non-governmental organisations, workers and industry groups, scientists, consumers and citizens. This will take us tonight from the usual jurisdictional questions about the divvying up of maritime areas between nation states and towards three current examples where international law needs to follow the industry, the vessels, and the fish products themselves. So protecting the catch brings us to some pretty fundamental questions about international law and how it can achieve collective objectives. Before I turn to my three current examples, let me recap on some foundations of international law which traditionally governs the relations between states and can be found in treaties or international agreements and custom. So consent is an important concept and states have consented to a large number of rules governing the oceans, which include certain sovereign freedoms and responsibilities. The Law of the Sea Convention codifies rules about maritime zones. A coastal state like Australia is permitted exclusive economic rights to the fish in the area 200 nautical miles from its shore. Australia gets to decide which boats can access this zone. But seaward from this 200 nautical miles is called the high seas, which is accessible to all states, although they are required to exercise their freedom of fishing with due regard for the interests of other states. The Law of the Sea Convention is helpful in establishing the basic rules, but there are many gaps in enforcing them. Monitoring vessels is difficult. Management is often shared between groups of fishing nations that meet under the auspices of specific regional fisheries management organisations. And though these bodies can restrict fishing, to certain quotas or promote other management techniques, not all countries agree to join up. When vessels fail to respect maritime zones or the governance arrangements of fisheries management, regional, uh, regional fisheries management organisations, they are engaged in what is called illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which experts refer to as IUU fishing, and which is linked to fish piracy or seafood fraud. Scientists have estimated that this IUU fishing accounts for between 13 and 31 per cent of catches and more than 50 per cent in some regions. To try to stop illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, interna international lawyers have had to keep in one hand the maps and boundaries of the Law of the Sea Convention and in the other, the catch certificates and other customs documentation of global fisheries markets. 
So the first of my three current examples is based um, in which countries and the way in which countries are closing their ports and markets to fish products that are suspected as implicated in illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. The European Union, for example, has designed a scheme that prohibits the import of illegally caught fish based on the failure of exporting countries to address the violations of their vessels. Yet such measures are likely to affect the existing conditions of trade between countries, many of whom are members of the World Trade Organization, the WTO. This example reminds us that international law has other functions besides fisheries sustainability, and under WTO rules, states have caught, sought to keep markets as free as possible. A famous case that demonstrated this issue was litigated in the 1990s when the United States tried to address environmental problems through an import ban on certain shrimp products. Scientists had found that some shrimp harvesting techniques inadvertently led to the death of endangered sea turtles, and the US closed off its domestic market to the shrimp caught with those techniques. Malaysia and some other countries successfully challenged this at the World Trade Organization. The tribunal accepted that the US measure related to the conservation of sea turtles, but that found that the US should have engaged in consultations with the countries affected by the ban, and through that process, seek less trade restrictive solutions to the need for changing fishing practices. This case and other recent cases, including a ban by the European Union on seal fur imports, shows that it is possible to design trade measures to close off markets to illegal, unreported and unregulated fish products, but that these need to be implemented in ways that do not discriminate between countries. My research also shows that when these tribunals hear the cases, they need to be open to concepts and ideas outside of a rather technocratic and isolated trade community. To learn about science, environmental studies, social capital and other issues, these tribunals need to move beyond the strict consent-based nature of international law. For example, they need to take into account the need to conserve sea turtles even if not all WTO members have ratified the relevant conservation treaty. My work on other areas, including climate and forests, show that this need for what I call regime interaction is an ongoing challenge for international law. Let me turn to my second example, which considers how law may try to reduce overcapacity. There are too many boats fishing for fewer and fewer fish. Countries currently support their domestic fishing industries with billions of dollars of subsidies. The majority of these enhance the capacity of the sector, if we go back to this graph, and are used to pay for fuel and other operating costs or even for ship construction. Research suggests as much as 54% of today's high seas fishing grounds would be unprofitable at current fishing rates without subsidies. To address this, lawyers have to move from the Law of the Sea Convention to trade rules again. States have agreed not to distort markets through certain subsidies at the World Trade Organization, so it could be possible for legal challenges to be brought against states. At this stage, we haven't had a case to challenge fisheries subsidies or other environmentally harmful subsidies like fossil fuel subsidies and instead have had cases involving subsidies of a different kind, like government support for renewable energy. Why countries are willing to litigate against the solar cell rebate program of India, but not any number of capacity enhancing fisheries subsidies is a question worth asking. Instead of litigation, countries have sought to clarify rules on fisheries subsidies by, by negotiations, but these are currently stalled. More successful have been efforts to agree on subsidy rules within smaller trade agreements, including the recent Trans-Pacific Partnership. An important political question will be whether TPP countries enforce their new prohibition on certain fisheries subsidies that's contained in this agreement. An important legal question will be to ask whether a trade tribunal faced with such a claim will be open to concepts 
and understandings outside of the fairly narrowly technocratic trade world if and when that happens, and whether it can draw safely enough from science and economics to identify the relevant capacity enhancing subsidy. My third example relates to a new agreement currently being negotiated as a side agreement under the Law of the Sea Convention, which is aimed to conserve marine biological diversity beyond national jurisdiction, which experts know as BBNJ, and which draws again on the high seas concept. The negotiations are due to commence formally next month on the 4th of September. Countries will decide upon new environmental management tools, including the use of marine protected areas to close off access to fisheries. Once again, the background existing laws impact on these efforts. A fisheries closure would override, for example, fishing quotas set by a regional fisheries management organisation. States do not wish to undermine existing frameworks, but equally, they need to allow international law to bridge regimes and evolve. My research shows that in these lawmaking efforts, the new rules should not be overly restricted by deference to existing international institutions. Once again, the consent-based principle of international law is necessarily stretched in the face of scientific developments and changing needs. So we have seen that international law governs the relations between states, not only by divvying up access to resources through the Law of the Sea Convention, but also by intervening in markets and supporting the types of relations that promote collective action in common pool areas. These objectives have been formally agreed by states and the current sustainable development goals endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly sets the target of 2020 to end overfishing, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing and destructive fishing practices, to conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas, and to prohibit certain forms of fisheries subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. Achieving this target requires, of course, political will, but it also demands a particular set of sensibilities. Achieving this target requires a decision-making structure that supports mutual learning and cooperation from state and non-state actors, the revisability of techniques and vocabularies and even cultures, and the interaction between regimes. When interests do not align, and this is inevitable, the trade-offs must be open so that the diffuse and collective interests do not simply capitulate to concentrated, powerful and individual ones. Sustainable fisheries is a complex problem. It requires complex solutions. Reforming the current unsustainable patterns of production and consumption requires lawyers to team up with economists, scientists, policy makers and those working in the fishing industry, among others. It also requires a more inclusive system of international law. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, next up, we have uh, Case Rowling. Case is the program leader, community-based fisheries in the fisheries and aquaculture division of Primary Industries and Regions South Australian Government, a person. He leads a team who develop and implement policy and undertake day-to-day -day management of a number of fisheries which are particularly important to both the commercial and recreational fishing sectors. A key focus in his work is to integrate evidence-based science into decision-making for the sustainable, development, sustainable management of these shared access fisheries. Welcome, Keith. The floor is yours. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, come and talk here today. Um, so we've already talked a little bit uh, about the FAO and their state of the fisheries and aquaculture report, um, which is touched on in a couple of the earlier talks. Um, this is a, a figure out of it which talks about global production uh, of fisheries and aquaculture. And you can see um, going forward that global production is increasing. And however, the fisheries part of this equation has been reasonably stable since 1990. And most of the slack, most of the additional seafood production has been taken up by aquaculture. Um, Given I come from a fisheries management background, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the fisheries management, uh, some concepts in relation to fisheries management, but I will touch on aquaculture towards the end and some opportunities that might be there in, in uh, might be around in the future in relation to that. Um, and I'll also start to talk about a few potential positive uh, things in relation to world fisheries production going forward as well as part of this. First up though, I think it's worth really talking about the key thing we're talking about, which is sustainable uh, utilisation of a resource. And from a fisheries perspective, um, this is a standard model in relation to a stock, a fish stock. Um, you can see through there that uh, you know, stock biomass increases through growth um, and increases through recruitment following reproduction. Um, it gets reduced through natural mortality so fish either die when they reach an early age or they're consumed by other fish um, or other species, and also through fishing mortality. And environmental conditions inf influence the productivity of the whole condition, and, and Reg talked a little bit about environmental conditions uh, in his talk. Probably an early concept I want you to um, consider here is fisheries management. We don't manage the fish. What we manage is the people accessing the fish. And I think it's really important to note that uh, you know, Margaret just talked about working together and thinking about how to work these sort of things. A lot of the concepts that come from this really do relate to the fact that fisheries management and aquaculture management to a certain extent relate to managing people um, and, and, and their impacts on fish stocks. So in the FAO report, it lists, uh, or it has a figure which relates to the global trends um, in the state of the fishery. So this is fish stocks. Um, we've already heard about 30, around 30% 30 of fish stocks being uh, biologically unsustainable. That's the orange section up the top and the increase through time and the fact that um, the underfish stocks have decreased uh, through the last 30 years or so as well. I think it's really interesting to note with this one that um, the, some of the effects of moving towards uh, overfish stocks and increased numbers of those uh, relate to the fact that back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, a lot of the developed countries started to bring in fisheries management regimes, uh, protect their stock, look at elements of having to do that, and there's been improvements going forward. But global demand has continued for seafood, and that's at a, at a fisheries level as well as the aquaculture level coming through. So developed countries have started to look at how they can um, you know, increase their trade and provide for themselves and for their regional neighbours and their communities. So I think in terms of um, going forward, one of the key challenges, and, uh, and Margaret already talked about one of the key challenges of moving towards all stocks being fished sustainably by 2020, you know, some of these, depending on life history and some of those other factors in relation to these species, will be a challenge to get to it by that time, but I think it's a, a really reasonable aspiration to have um, going forward. I thought it was worthwhile just touching quickly on the status of Australian fisheries. Um, interestingly here, it talks about 69% of stocks being sustainable. This is taken out of the status of Australian fish stocks uh, report that FRDC do every two years. There's one coming out later on this year. There's a couple of additional categories that are in this one. I think the key point here um, in terms of Australian fisheries is we've tried to move towards some consistent terminology across Australian fisheries so people understand um, you know, some transparency and some comparable nature of these stock status classifications um, to try and give some certainty to people um, by adopting it nationally. 
Important to note, this is about fish stocks, and so was the, uh, the figure I gave you from the FAO before. From an overall production perspective, over 80% of Australian fisheries production sits in that sustainable range. And as I said, this is a couple of years old in relation to that as well. So coming back to the role of fisheries management, and the last figure that uh, Margaret put up I think is a really interesting one in terms of people having to be broadly experts. You know, fisheries management, there's some real strong linkages between uh, setting those management arrangements, those legal and those legislative or policy-based uh, developments and interacting with stakeholders in relation to those, consulting with people, but you've also got your compliance, the illegal, uh, unregulated, unreported fishing, um, and some of the enforcement that's uh, around in relation to that. And I think it's really important to note that you know, any fisheries management arrangements that get, get put in place, I think are only as good as some of the, the compliance or the or, or, um, regimes that are put in place in relation to them. And notice education awareness is quite important um, in relation. But then we have our monitoring of fish stocks, our research to understand what's happening and why stocks are changing and why different things are happening. And fisheries management sits amongst all of those different, um, different uh, parts of the equation and I think it's really important um, you know to have those inclusive conversations to speak to people about that is one of the key aspects um, whether it's global fisheries or local fisheries moving forward. So some of the key tools that are used in fisheries management a lot of these relate and I'll, I'll talk about examples uh, in terms of developed and, and um, developing countries but you know there's some Key principles, input controls. Um, one of the main ones that was put in place, probably going into the 50s, 60s, 70s in most of the developed countries was limited entry and licensing systems. Um, and I think that, that one has enabled the collection of data and information uh, going forward um, that has allowed a little bit more contemporary fish, fisheries management to occur through time. Um, Vessel and gear restrictions, restrictions in numbers and restrictions in um, the amount of gear or the type of gear that can be used, um, and then seasonal and spatial management. Um, there's some well-known output controls, most people know them as quotas or catch limits, um, effort limits are another output control, it's a tool that can be used. Um, it's important to note that most fisheries have a combination of both of these, and that's really um, as a result of the fact that Fishing activity for an individual species is one thing, but the effect on the ecosystem of the gear type or whatever else is being used has to be considered when it comes to um, when it comes to any sort of uh, sustainability across the board in relation to um, activities that are being undertaken. The last point down the bottom, allocation. I think Margaret talked about this quite a bit in terms of, you know, the nitty gritty of the discussions of you know who can take what and when and where. You know, it very much doesn't matter whether it's here in South Australia or across Australia or around the world, that's when the vast majority of some of the nitty gritties of discussion happens going forward in relation to that. So having good evidence and information to underpin some of those sort of, that decision making process is really, really important. Um, the research and monitoring and stock assessment components. So we've got estimates of uh, fish stock going forward. One of the key things or principles to get across here, I think is data availability is really limiting. So in fisheries where, in some of the developing countries where you don't, there's very little information collected on catch and effort. In fact, people are fishing for subsistence fishing to feed their, feed, uh, you know, their, their local communities. Um, that's one of the real challenges. Probably most of the developed countries have a, a concept called the precautionary principle built in, enshrined in the legislation, which means you can, you know, in, even though there's a lack of available information, it doesn't preclude you from making decisions to protect and ensure the sustainability of stocks. Um, we have the fishery dependent information, some of that catch and effort information I talked about, um, which you know, over the years obviously has some extremely long data sets. There's some here in South Australia that are 25, 30 years long and it's a really uh, important resource when it comes to looking at those stock classifications. And then when it comes to fisheries modelling in some of the more developed countries, you know, things like biomass mortality and growth and recruitment come into those models. Um, but it's important to note that even with that information, the complexity increases with shared stocks and migratory species. So you might have a stock that straddles boundaries or is on the high seas, and going through all those, you have different information in different parts of your area. And to tease that out is also a bit of a challenge, I think, um, when it comes to decision-making and setting management arrangements. 
And the other one, um, Margaret talked in depth about illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Um, I think you know, the main thing there is it occurs in the high seas, it occurs uh, in national fisheries regimes, in regional, in local as well, uh, in terms of uh, s some of the you know, impact of these and certainly t you know, taking that into account and thinking about it in terms of management arrangements is a very important. Um, Margaret talked about the initiative to prevent, deter and eliminate it. I think one of the key points I took when I read a little bit about this, you know, was this global sharing of information. The, again, it comes down to sharing information and sharing uh, uh, data and, um, and enabling people to be able to understand what's going on. And so there's uh, you know, programs like global sharing of vessel data that's coming up and, and being signed off. Um, guidelines for the marking of fishing gear. So when gear is lost or it's put in and it's illegal to put it in place, having these marking arrangements make a little bit of a difference to look at where they've come from and even getting that more of that understanding of catch documentation, looking at that catch and effort that I was talking about going forward. So there's some of the key tenets. I thought it might be worth talking to you a little bit about potentially some opportunities, although there's some challenges in relation to these opportunities. Um, in terms of you know, we saw we were, there's an expectation that you know, trying to maintain fisheries at their current productions is a bit of a challenge and Reg talked a little bit about possible solutions through uh, different species. I think one of the key things that's done particularly in Asian countries uh, as a recovery tool in degraded environments is artificial reefs um, and you've got you know, a big question there of production versus aggregation and, and I think you know, interestingly having a look online this is a 30,000 ton metal structure that got put out uh, in terms of artificial reefs. Interesting from the headline, it was also in place to stop some Chinese, it was done by Korean, Korea, South Korea, but it was also to stop some Chinese trawlers coming through and fishing in a certain area because you wouldn't want to hook your net up over one of these sort of things. Um, so yeah, one thing is about production and trying to increase your production uh, in terms of those areas that are heavily targeted. Um, and the other one is you know, about some of these disincentives to other countries coming into your areas. Fish aggregating devices, uh, one that's used quite a lot in the Pacific and in other parts of the world, generally you know, the challenge there is they do that aggregation uh, side of things that I talked about at the top, effectively just make uh, fish easier to catch. So even if your biomass is dropping, you end up with fish uh, you know, catch rates still being reasonably high. It makes it hard to tease that out when it comes to some of the, um, some, some of the science and the information and long-term data sets. And another tool that's thought about is fish stocking. Um, you know, so when we looked at that cycle of fish production, talked about recruitment, um, you know, you're basically growing fish up to a level of being fingerlings and then putting them back out in the wild, or, or, or maybe larger than that, um, to increase that production of that fish stock um, going forward. I think Reg talked a bit about Providence and knowing a bit more about your, uh, where, you, where your seafood might come from. I think third party certification is an interesting uh, concept. I think the majority of people would probably be aware of it here, but commenced in 1999. 20% of the global production of seafood um, is currently uh, looked at under s different types of certifi certification uh, schemes. And interestingly, you know, Woolworths and Coles over here in, in, South, in, in Australia both look, are looking at aiming for sustainable fisheries moving forward or having third party certification as an extra check. Um, it's really an extra you know, level of, um, uh, of check and balance in relation to management arrangements and what are happening, what's happening to ensure you know, sustainable fisheries management moving forward. And it's a good incentive for, for, for companies, countries or fisheries or, or, or regions to be able to um, you know, tighten up their management arrangements to enable them to reach different markets around the place. One of the challenges, it's costly, it's difficult to obtain. Uh, particularly for de developing countries or, or smaller scale fisheries. So it tends to be a challenge. There's a few countries and regions um, that have basically come up with their own programs which are endorsed by the FAO, uh, responsible fisheries management programs. Um, Iceland, who is one of the major producers, if you looked at Reg's map when he came up there, and Alaska are two of those that have these responsible fisheries management programs. So I said I finish off just quickly on aquaculture and you know it is one of the main keys to food production moving forward um, even currently is you know looking at getting close to that 50 50 percent of the the production and I think there's a couple of uh, 
items to think about in relation to this. Uh, one is the, um, the multi-trophic, you know, putting complementary uh, uh, aquaculture or, or fisheries related act activities together to try and uh, you know limit footprints I think going forward is a is a concept that I think is starting to be looked at in certain parts of the world and certainly can be thought of uh, in terms of future development of aquaculture I think in the FAO report the the Chinese uh, are looking to redevelop their fisheries and aquaculture um, over the next five years and one of the key things they're looking to do um, is reduce the extent of their um, of their aquaculture and basically try to get to a point where they're um, they're uh, condensing their aquaculture into smaller areas so probably trying to move away from the picture edge put up which had those you know vast swathes or scales of, of some of their uh, of some of that shrimp farming um, in those areas couple of other things that are recently you know, starting to pop up in the literature, um, Heidi Alloway from Adelaide Uni and, and the Nature Conservancy, one of the big NGOs have been looking at ecosystem services for, for aquaculture and I think you know, the, the figure on the right has got some information uh, in terms of provisioning and regulating cultural and habitat and supporting um, natures for, for, for shellfish aquaculture. Obviously food provisioning um, is one of the key ones when it comes to aquaculture but it's Probably looking at some of the roles in terms of regulating filtration and, and denitrification um, going forward and how you know, aquaculture can be positioned in ways to actually have ecosystem services. And macroalgae is another you know, really important one and carbon sequestration. You know, there's a few predictions in relation to if there's some increasing macroalgae production around the world to meet some of those carbon sequestration uh, targets going forward. Probably one other thing, uh, Reg had a, a, a a, uh, um, a figure up there that looked at climate change. Finfish uh, aquaculture is reasonably, or there's a bit of recent research about it being reasonably resilient to, to climate change, um, particularly in terms of, uh, you know, looking at animal husbandry methodologies and things like that um, going forward. So when it comes to that global production, I think, you know, finfish in particular probably has an opportunity uh, different to what some of the other species may have going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Our last speaker of uh, today is Dr. Zoe Doubleday. Zoe is a research fellow and a marine ecologist here at the University of Adelaide School of Biological Sciences. Uh, she investigates how marine plants and animals respond for better or worse to our changing environment. Zoe has a particular interest in weedy species, adaptable organi organisms like squid that thrive in the face of change. It is these species that may be our future source of food and the future key players that keep our oceans healthy. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you. So in the five minutes I have, I'm going to tell you how we can protect the catch, potentially from the perspective of an ecologist. So I'm going to talk about weedy species. So this species might be things like cephalopods, they're like squid and octopus, jellyfish and many species of algae. So what is a weedy species? Well, one, they're plastic, and that's not the thing you recycle. We, in biological terms, we often refer to an organism as plastic if they're very flexible with their body. So for instance, like this transformer here, it can change its shape as the environment suits. And weedy species can do that. There's a giant species of squid, the jumbo squid, that's eating its way up the eastern Pacific into the US. And what happened when an El Nino event it increased its body size by 10 times and doubled its longevity. So you can imagine, say, in South Australia when the millennium drought broke, that suddenly there's water, there's plentiful food, that overnight humans were 15 metres high. So they're the sort of things we're talking about, that they, these animals can change very quickly as the environment does. They're also short-lived, so like this sunflower here, it breeds, it dies, they're annuals. They're, off, they're often annuals, live for a very short period of time. So what that helps, it can adapt quickly. 
So for a squid, you might have, you know, by six months of age, they're middle-aged because by year one, they're already dead. So the problem with that, they don't have much overlap of generations. So if one generation dies out, the population, population can wipe out very quickly. But what that enables them to do is that the environment is changing rapidly because of that us, they can adapt and evolve to that change. So as I said, this makes weedy species adaptable. And I've got this picture of a weed growing in a crack in a, in a brick in a, for a very particular reason, because this crack here is an environment that humans have created. It's novel. This hasn't occurred before. So that animals and plants haven't encountered this crack in the brick before. But look what's found a home. This weed here has found this home. It's flourishing. And it does so because like weeds of the sea, this terrestrial weed is very plastic, it's short-lived, it's physiologically tolerant, and it's adaptable. So weedy species can take advantage of changing environmental conditions quickly and efficiently, allowing them to boom. So a squid, for instance, can it might be outcompete a fish in a rapidly changing environment, as opposed to fish can ride out more stable, stable environment. But then they can disappear. But we know they do have an innate ability to bounce back. They disappear because they don't have overlapping generations. So some research we did here at the University of Adelaide a couple of years ago found that many species of cephalopod were increasing around the world. So they were benefiting. So most of the time we're hearing stories of decline and loss. Your large predatory fish, your seabirds, marine mammals are going down. And that we've got this increase. And cephalopod fisheries are a, quite a big thing in many parts of the world. So they're also being exploited, particularly in areas like Japan. So what's going on there? Well, there was an older hypothesis that cephalopods are proliferating because we're taking the more fish out of the sea, creating space in the ocean. And because they're fast growing, they're fast paced, they re can replace those fish quite quickly. So there's some anecdotal evidence this occurred in the Southern Ocean, where an area where the ice fish were removed and the, the octopus moved in and proliferated. But it's still anecdotal and it's something we need to look into more. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, a lot lately, it's not about the fish per se, is that we're creating change in the environment so rapidly that we're giving animals and plants that were naturally just ephemeral species that boom and bust a competitive edge because we're making conditions more suitable for them. So maybe they're becoming more permanent. And you may wonder why I've got a picture of a forest behind me is because a, um, research came out that showed woody vines called lianas are overtaking tropical rainforest. And they said that because the trees in the rainforest were your sort of old growth, slow growing trees, like your large fish, and the woody vines are your weedy species. And they suggested because we're changing the environment, the forest so quickly that the woody vines are taking over. So I thought maybe that's something is happening in the sea. So you might be bringing it back to seafood futures and how this may help us protect the catch. Is a lot of these weedy species aren't traditionally fish. They are more so in Asian countries. But can we balance out the human pressure, taking, putting more on the species that can take it and less on the species that cannot? So that's the sort of key question I'm looking at now. And there's caveats there. There's a maybe, because a lot of the time, we know a lot less about these animals. They're traditionally not researched as much. Sometimes we don't even know how long they live, where they go, what they feed on, or what environmental variables make them tick. So I suggest that we become like that weed growing in that crack in the brick. We become like that, and we become more adaptable because we're creating an environment of so much change. And as Reg mentioned earlier, there might be you know, opportunities for developing new fisheries and finding out more about plants and animals that are doing well will be a first step to that. Thank you. So now I'm going to invite, I'm um, going to change hats here. Now I'm going to invite the speakers from today. I think they'll 
give a round of applause for all the speakers. So I'm going to be asking a few questions first and then we'll hand it over to the audience. So I'm going to borrow Margaret's great line that there's too many boats fishing for fewer fish. And we know our population is both growing and we're eating more seafood per person as well. And so aquaculture production seems to be booming, while wild fisheries production seems to be mat um, remaining static. So is aquaculture really the new panacea for sustainable seafood? Well, I think that... Um as you've seen from the figures, the big increase in seafood since the 90s has been in aquaculture. And that's because, as I've tried to explain, there are some finite elements in wild capture fisheries at present. We can do modifications of coastlines and change things, as we did with terrestrial agriculture. At this point, in some places in the world, that's happening. But there is a big debate in many countries as to whether we want that kind of future or not. Mm -hmm. So hence the tension around aquaculture development. But I think that's really where the production increase will happen. Yeah, and I think you know, I tried to touch on the back end of my talk in terms of some of the other possible um, benefits of thinking about where what aquaculture goes where. And I, and I think certainly when you look at uh, global need and global demand, you start to think about, okay, well, what's the most appropriate way, what's a sustainable way to increase that demand? Um, obviously, uh, thinking about it in terms of you don't want to be clearing uh, mangrove forests away to enable uh, prawn farming or shrimp farming in different areas if you can help it. And coming up with, um, you know, some uh, some uh, international regimes or, or laws in relation to those, I think, will aid that. The other one is really thinking about are there other advantages to aquaculture, um, like talking about in relation to other ecosystem services and how you can end up with a, potentially a um, still some type of uh, you know net benefit um, in relation to those activities that are being taken. And I was on a, from a more legal perspective, is there any legal tools that could sort of facilitate or is there legal problems that you could see with rapid expansion of aquaculture potentially? Well, I think um, one important thing which Reg has already mentioned about aquaculture are the figures now um, in terms of sustainability of, of fish as a global resource. So if aquaculture now farmed fish are being fed fish, mm. well, clearly the numbers have to be crunch to determine whether that is a sustainable outcome. Um, clearly there are laws that can be, you know, utilised and even developed uh, to address these types of concerns and international environmental law contains a number of principles like the precautionary principle that Reg already mentioned which will enable decision makers to use, you know, to make decisions even where the scientific evidence is still uncertain relying on the conserv conservation of the resource as a primary objective. Um, and, yeah, I think that that needs to be a, a major question for decision makers. Where will law facilitate the best decision making? So I just try to go back to what Reg mentioned. Uh, I didn't bring these graphs to, in my uh, slides, but I re remember very clearly uh, a few years ago so when I see uh, two graphs about... China's fisheries production. So one, China is now the world's largest uh, marine uh, fisheries uh, produ uh, producer. So China has been developing, just use this as examples, China has been developing the aquaculture for years to feed uh, its 1.4 billion people. So while the aquaculture production is going on and move up, the, the catch didn't uh, decrease. The catch increased as well. So then, so which means Indeed, it seems that aquaculture is promoted as a solution, but it didn't really help. Why? Then I think one of the reasons is not really legal, it's, it's kind of demand, as Case mentioned. So more people in the country become 
uh, change their food uh, structure to eat more fish than meat. So, so while you are developing, you catch more, you also develop more aquaculture, but then because of the demand, then aquaculture itself might not necessarily be a solution mm -hmm. for uh, meeting the demand. Yeah, that's not really legal, but that's kind of really something coming to my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so while we're on the sort of legal side of things, um, thanks, Margaret and Yugi, for um, taking us through some of the legal developments relating to the high seas. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the tragedy of the commons, and is that tragedy inevitable? Yeah, I think that that metaphor is powerful for a lot of people, this idea that there's really nothing one can do. This is a, a ceaseless tragedy that will play out in grazing areas, in pastures, in fishing areas and so on. Um, but scholars like Eleanor Ostrom within the field of institutional economics have demonstrated through empirical work that there are common pool areas or commons areas that have been managed over hundreds or even thousands of years and that there are various institutional factors, communities who monitor one another, um, who, who have developed trust through repeat actions, who even use graduated sanctions for bad behaviour. These are the types of factors that can guarantee the resource is not dissipated. Uh, and I think the challenge for international lawyers is to, to trace that empirical work and ask whether internationally we can create those kinds of conditions. Mm. And I'm optimistic that they can be done, but it does require us to use a whole range of tools, including the trade tools that I discussed this evening. Mm -hmm. Did you add or? No, it's good. Yeah, it's really hard to answer. Mm. <laughs> so there is, I think, one thing which we call the ocean optimism uh, in our discussions whenever when you are talking about oceans. But indeed, we have issues, we have problems, and we have overfishing problems, problems for years now. Uh, I'm trying to think more positively using the example that I actually mentioned about uh, the fisheries in the, in the Antarctic waters, the recently established Ross Sea marine protected areas. And by accommodating no take areas with some sort of research fishing areas and special research areas to further figure out well, to what extent can we fish sustainably in a new area. That seems to be a very good uh, try that the efforts the international community has been, has been doing to try to avoid this tragedy of commons or the Olympic way of fishing mm -hmm. by try to managing, try to manage the fisheries more carefully and more sustainably. And I think, I think that's possible. It is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Australians love seafood and I'm one of those Australians as well. What can we as consumers do to help, you know, protect the catch? We've heard a few things come up tonight. Does anyone want to unpack what we could do? I'd like to make another plea mm -hmm. that, and it's been on, on television and everything else, that, that in, in order for managers to have tools, in order for marketers to have tools, we really do have to know exactly what that seafood is that we're being mm -hmm. offered for sale. And actually, when you think about the dynamics of each fishery, whether the slavery involved, whether mm -hmm. they destroyed the bottom, you'd actually like to know very specifically where that fishery was and how the, that seafood got here. And we still, if you look at the supermarkets, yeah. you still find it's rather vague. Yeah. And I had a slide that I didn't have time to put in where the comparable thing would be a meat tray and it would say mammal on it. <laughs> and that would be all you got to know. Yeah, it came from Earth and it's mammal. And because we're basically crossing almost phyla of animals mm. and, and if, if we can home it down to fish, marine fish sometimes, we're doing quite good. Mm. And then you've highlighted the human side, so I often think if this species is sustainable, but there's aspects of slavery and things like that in fisheries that we'd all probably be one to be aware of as a consumer. Yeah, and I think the supply chain is a really important you know, part of that. And, and I, I put up the slide in relation to third party certification. Well, not only is that looking at the sustainable management of the resource and it investigates the, the, the management, the science, it also has uh, some really strong uh, demands and, and strong 
um, processes in relation to supply chain. You know, so there's examples of actually knowing you know, an individual fish that gets tagged on a vessel that ends up um, in your, uh, it, uh, you know, at your supermarket or where you can actually trace back that fish to the individual operator. So it's almost the flip side of uh, what Reg was just talking about, about you've got no idea where this, you know, this piece of white protein is coming from, flipping it the other way. And I think you know, it's not the only answer in relation to it, but I think it really is one of the key ones for us who can be educated consumers to think about in relation to what we're doing you know, with our choices going forward. I guess I could um, offer some trade law perspectives on this. So the competing um, interests would be wary that uh, information on products might be a trade barrier, it might create paperwork and be um, unreasonable for producers to, to wear as costs. Um, but even within the WTO rules, it is permissible for, for consumers to expect a, a level of information on the products. Um, these can be justified and consumers in a lot of countries outside of Australia do demand and are given a lot more information about their fish products. Mm. Yeah. So just the last question here. If there's one thing that you'd like to see changed or improved in the seafood industry or fishing or the science or in any way we do it, what would that be? Maybe go through. Well, I won't repeat myself about the problems of the seafood. I guess, I guess the public have to make, they have to be part of the decision about what we do about the increase in productivity of the marine resources mm -hmm. that we're going to require in the future. It's happening around us. And I'm afraid that that might even mean modifications of the ocean because that seems to be something that's proceeding with or without our are knowing what's going to happen at war, making decisions about it. Some countries are making decisions about it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me it probably comes back a little bit to Margaret's slide she put up at the end about people working together towards common goals. And and I think you know there's so much you know passion and and uh, disparate you know beliefs and values in, in, in the seafood sector, whether it's locally or, or, or looking at it globally, and for everyone to come together and think about that common goal of sustainable utilisation of the resource going forward um, and maybe putting aside some of their individual values or their, um, uh, you know, or their individual country values and, and, and thinking about it in terms of that global perspective, I think, would be a positive thing. Yeah, I'm very keen to hear questions from the floor because I think that you all as citizens and consumers are going to have ideas about what is the, the crucial uh, intervention that you can make. Uh, from the work that I do in international law, I see that citizens and consumers make change every day. Uh, so in the litigation at the WTO, these are often cases that have been brought because uh, citizens and consumers have demanded uh, a, a ban on seal fur because they consider hunting to be against their um, public morals or a range of environmental objectives that they've seen played out. And even in Australia, we had a lot of public interest in whaling, which led Australia to take Japan to court at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which has, again, led to some very fruitful change. So you are more empowered than perhaps possibly you think you are and I'd be very keen to hear your views. So, um, what, why I'm keen to do this is what I, I want to see more dialogues between uh, different disciplines uh, in the ocean governance issues. So over the years, in I think it's happening, but over the years what I've been observing uh, when I was in, for example, marine conservation conferences, uh, I probably, I've, was normally the only lawyer there, and then mm -hmm. people don't understand each other, and then so this is so this kind of event is my passion that I I think which also would support a more reasonable law making to regulate sustainable fisheries to bring all relevant ocean related disciplines together to talk to each other, communicate with each mm -hmm. other in an effective way, and then also include the public opinions to make a very effective legislation. That is my passion and my suggestion. Yes, definitely agree with that. More people from different disciplines coming together. 
like today. So now we're going to hand it over to you. Now I think, do we have a microphone out there? Yes, great. So, questions for the panel? Oh, one back there, quick. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. Um, a couple of years ago there was quite a lot of controversy about a super trawler, I think that was the term that was used, maybe Dutch flag that came into Australian waters. I know that in agriculture upscaling and industrialisation is, is a real trend. Is this large scale of trawler a trend within aquaculture, um, fisheries, and what are the problems associated with it? Uh, perhaps there are some good elements as well. Um, just wondering if we can hear some thoughts about that globally. Well, as you know, it's an incredibly emotive issue in many places of Australia, and in Tasmania as well, because a large trawler, especially one that's, that comes from outside of Australia, evokes quite a strong pushback, particularly from people who consider that it's, it, it's sharing resources with even recreational fishing, etc. But I think we have to realize that in order, you remember the food web, if we're feeding ourselves closer to the bottom, the smaller fish closer to the bottom, we can actually consume more fish from, from the marine environment. And one of the advantages, obviously, of a larger vessel, like the ones we've come to know now, is they have freezers and ability to process on board. One of the disadvantages, I guess, is that we really have to be vigilant about fishing practices because they have a large capacity to take, a, and they need to take a large resource in order to make themselves operate. So it's, it will remain controversial, and uh, around the world, those fisheries that, uh, that operate closer to the bottom of the food web are those ones which we deem uh, perhaps underutilized. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but certainly there are going to be uh, and will be uh, pressures to <coughs> greater harvest those resources. Yeah, I think um, the, uh, I remember when the debate about the super trawler started, I think 2012, 2013, when it was coming in, part of the, the emotion about that debate was what fishing activity was going on in other parts of the world as well. And in fact, that vessel um, was talked about as going in and decimated, mating, I think it was one of the South American fisheries. So I think you know, one of the things is, you know, management arrangements are not created equal across all jurisdictions. Um, there are different uh, management regimes going forward, but I think that vigilance in relation to uh, all those different aspects, whether they be the, the management arrangements, the research and the science that underpins the decision making um, and the compliance and those other factors that come in need to be looked at on their merits um, in relation to any type of activity, whether that's a scale up in terms of fishing or, or some increased production or increased catch levels, um, or whether that's an increase in aquaculture production. Now, we do have some quite strong zoning policies and things like that in Australia in relation to those. One of the things we've talked about here is you know, how can you know, that spread, that prolifer pr proliferation of aquaculture maybe be, um, be thought of a little bit differently going forward when it comes to some of the impacts that that has uh, from, a, from a, a net perspective in relation to um, the environment around the world. Okay. So we've got okay. next question. So, yep. so many, yep. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, been very interesting. It seems that the biggest threat to the fishing industry is the fishing industry. And I wonder if you would comment about threats from other industries. And I'm thinking about the tension at the moment between the petroleum industry and the fisheries in the Australian Bight. We also hear about conflict between defence industry and fisheries and things like runoff from agriculture. And I wonder how the fisheries law relates to these other possible threats. Uh, thank you. And uh, I actually disagree with uh, your opening uh, comment that the biggest threat to the fishing uh, is fisheries, is fishing industry. Actually, if you think, think so I, that's what I think. I always think the fish is kind of a very important, essential component of the marine ecosystem. So they are part of the marine ecosystem. So indeed, overfishing or, and or 
Are you you fishing? They are problematic. They cause problems for fish and fisheries, but they are just one aspect of the problems. You, we do have other problems such as climate change, such as uh, other other legitimate uses of the sea. Uh, including, as you mentioned, the petroleum uh, industry and defense industry, and so on. That's why now it is it is quite trendy that we are moving towards what we call the ecosystem approach or the integrated management. That, so when we are establishing the fisheries management, we do need to think the different legitimate use of the sea and how to regulate them in an uh, integrated way, rather than just regulate fisheries alone or fishing industry alone. Otherwise, it won't work. That's my uh, my view. Okay, so we might just oh there. Okay. Yeah, picking up the point about the um, sort of uh, confused Providence information that's available to Australian consumers. If the world trade provisions were fully exploited by the Australian government or Australian agencies, how much more information about Providence could Australian consumers expect from their on their imported seafood? So uh, Keith mentioned a little bit about the um, scientific developments in electronic traceability. Um, so uh, what I've seen is that a huge amount of information is actually now available and indeed many jurisdictions are starting to use that electronic traceability information in a lot of their trade mechanisms. So in the US, for example, they're now moving to establish a lot more regulation of the trade inflows based on um, the information that they're now able to access um, and so there and particularly of course with um, you know big data and the use of um, satellite sensing and our own phones and so on there's a huge amount that we now know about where the fish is coming from and where it's going uh, so it isn't inconceivable that that information could be included in the products that we buy the counter interest would be that rules of origin um, provisions are expensive and they take up um, the resources of the producers and they can be barriers to trade um, if they are leading to discriminatory treatment between countries. Uh, so the um, countries need to justify the use of these labels, which they can do on, on the, in the way that I read the legal texts, because of the environmental sustainability underpinning the necessary measures. Yeah, but there is also the question of value added. I mean, if some people are willing to pay more for seafood mm -hmm. that they know this information about. I mean, in North America, it's not uncommon on the cans of salmon to have barcodes that you can scan so that you can see the fisherman in his boat that caught that particular mm -hmm. fish. I, I know that's a ridiculous concept for all seafoods, particularly those that have been adulterated and have been re-exported and imported five times, but but that concept of adding value might be a positive mm. way to move forward. And they see it as a benefit to Australian seafood as well as eco-labelling to boost the value and of our niche product. So the lady in the red there. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel, thank you, it was very interesting. I wanted to ask the panel what they felt about our regional responsibilities to the fisheries. I work with the um, PNG fisheries and you see a situation there where you've got a lot of subsistence fishery and um, requirements for protein and an increasing population. You've got a country who wants to grow its export industries through fisheries. You've got exploitation of the fishery, particularly beche de mer and the little pretty fishes that look nice in aquariums keep disappearing. And then you've got this idea that this might be an area in the Polynesian seas where you've got bigger impacts from climate change. I'm not an expert in that by any stretch of the imagination. What I wondered if you thought that Australia has responsibilities to our region in terms of fisheries management beyond the management of our own fisheries. So I think, yeah, as you look at it um, in terms of trying to translate knowledge and information and provide guidance um, and assist, I think there definitely is a role to play there and there are um, existing agreements to try and bring um, uh, uh, some representatives from Indonesia, PNG across to try and learn uh, you know, or to get, get a bit more information about how to sustainably manage their fisheries. I think 
there's also a couple of centres. I think University of Wollongong has a, a sort of South Pacific uh, centre where they bring people in to, to train them and look at them from there. In terms of Australia's responsibility, I think that there is a responsibility for us within our region um, uh, and within the world to try and lead the way when it comes to things and assist where, where is necessary. So, you know, my opinion there is, yes, there is a role for us to play within that one. I think we do it through education and through some of these ways of upskilling and, and, and assisting with people. I know in certain areas, um, some of the compliance is taken over by Australian um, compliance officers to assist some of our near neighbours in relation to that as well. So there's probably some tangible examples of where there are there is assistance that's happening and going on. But I think that the short answer is yes, there is a role or a responsibility for us, particularly within our region, but also in that global context. Yeah, I would quickly endorse that and um, also note that when the law of the sea codified those maritime zones, many of these developing Pacific islands were the great beneficiaries because they suddenly had massive um, areas of their own exclusive economic rights to which they could then sell on to other countries who would get access rights to those areas. Um, but those arrangements were not always uh, playing out very well for the Pacific island countries. Um, there was exploitation that happened. And indeed, the decision of some of them has been to close off access completely, um, and even to close off fishing completely. So Palau would be an example of that quite extreme response. Um, and it relates back to the earlier question about the connection between the fishing industry and other industries. So Palau's response was based on a recognition that ecotourism was going to be more beneficial for them than a, than a fishing industry that was going to be over, overly exploiting the resource. Okay. Just a quick follow-up. I, I do also endorse that Australia has a responsibility uh, in the Asia-Pacific region in particular. But I think the big question is how? How to export Australian standards and Australia fisheries management practice to the rest of the region or to the rest of the world? There are a few different pathways. For example, the, the bigger economies, in, uh, such as the European Union, and the United States, they, they, because it's a big market there and it's unavoidable in most cases to deal with them, so they use their internal standards to an internal market to export their in external standards. So how, how, how so? In order to access to the EU market, you have to follow EU standards, and that, that, no matter wh where you're coming from. So in that way, the EU standards is exported externally to the other part of the world. And I think Australian economy is not big enough as that, in that sense, comparing to EU and the US, but that is a way that Australia can consider in some situations with, to, with some countries. Uh, but also at the same time, um, there are also different pathways to do so, like provide aid and education and raise awareness. I think that's all Australia can and should do. It's a responsibility. Okay, we just have one more quick question. Uh, yes, we close. We, uh, I heard that you saying that uh, we need the key questions. We need the, the big uh, solutions. Mm. And um, that we, we've, we've, we've gone into the Olympic scales. That is a problem. And that, uh, I mean, I hear that you saying that the uh, one solution is about the uh, adaptabilities but we don't want to be like a weed. But we can go into the solution of uh, legal um, you know, development. The problem is between demands and legal, if we go into legal too much, the demand, the people, you know, they cannot freely get what they need. They can be in trouble. But we go into too much legal, too much, you know, a kind of let them go free for their need. There is no order. So we need to go between the justice, legal, and the um, 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 demands, love. And in here, that we have to, to face with two problems, dilemma, between legal, between justice, and love. And here it is. The key in here, you're saying that not really about fish, but about management, about the people, how the people use this. And that is the big problem, how to 
and you educate people about their over over exploit and the key in here that it is greedy and God asked us to you know manage the world and you are doing well and we have to deal with that how to educate people to get away from greediness and how you do that so how to educate people how do you put how that you know a kind of education into your the huge issues in here legal environment and everything yes well lots of topics there quick answer do we have one how to educate well we we have now come together the people who are doing the legal stuff, the people doing the marketing stuff, the people doing the education, because the, it is a wicked problem trying to solve mm -hmm. these problems. And it, we're not just doing fisheries modeling, we have to work with the people and we have to find a way forward. Um, there isn't going to be any easy way. It's the same as all the other challenges the, the world is facing, I'm afraid. Right, look, I think we might um, draw it to a close there. It's been a very thought-provoking and uh, slightly alarming <laughs> presentation we've had tonight. Um, it's hard not to reflect that maybe our children, certainly our grandchildren, are going to look back on our generation and judge us on the quality of the solutions we come up with for problems like this. It's not an easy issue, and the last question makes an important point, I think. It's hard to believe we'll solve this solely by legal means. This is going to require a level of cooperation that we're not particularly well known for uh, achieving. So we have a huge challenge in front of us. I'd certainly like to thank the speakers tonight. That was a great presentation and I hope you all enjoyed it. I have a gift here. I'll, I'll bring one over. I'm not going to put you through the pain of watching me do this five times. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll start at this end. But there is one for everybody. We, uh, we spend big here. So can I um, thank you all once again for uh, coming along tonight and um, keep an eye out for the next Research Tuesday and uh, you're certainly welcome to come any time. It's great to see such terrific public support. So can you please join me in thanking our speakers tonight. <laughs>